cloud. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final installment of Financing the Future. I am very excited today. We have the heavyweight champion of progressive economics himself, INET's favorite speaker, Mr. Andrew Sheng. Round of applause, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we have a lot to cover, so why don't we get right into it? Uh, Mr. Sheng, you have a presentation for us, so please uh, give us your introduction, and uh, I'm handing things over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, I want to thank Jay and the YSI for inviting me again. This is a very exciting um, phase uh, as I you know, read about the uh, Human Capital Network. Uh, I've realized that you've gone way ahead uh, in many ways out of the mainstream into new areas. And that's exactly what it should be. Uh, we should rethink what is money. Um, and so I'm going to give you, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, what is a main mainstream uh, thinking. But I want to ask the question, what is the imaginative power of money? You know, and how can we make uh, money more inclusive? That's, that's a, a, a serious question. Now, um, as we know, we money has shifted from physical coins, you know, the old cowrie shells, uh, then, you know, gold coins, uh, copper coins, and then the paper money. And now we've moved to cyber currency. Okay. This is a major shift and it's all done through technology, right? You know, paper money could have only been uh, uh, done because of printing of paper, right? And then, you know, with the, uh, um, the expansion of the central bank balance sheet, uh, last year was historic in the sense that the major central banks of the world created $9 trillion of a balance sheet, okay, which actually increased the liquidity worldwide. Remember that the total GDP of the world last year was just under $90 trillion. So 10% more funding was provided without inflation. Uh, and therefore, it broke the old idea that money shouldn't be created just like that, point number one. And point number two, uh, uh, it does mean that actually resource is available for anything you want to do, but you have to use it for a good end. Uh, and that's very, very critical. But then, you know, the, the problem is that central banks are such um, temples of, uh, of orthodoxy. Uh, their job is to maintain overall monetary and financial stability. They have taken the very important uh, stance that because of their independence, they don't want to get into a resource allocation role. That's for the Ministry of Finance and that's for the market. But we're now in actually a collective action trap, as we all know. The world is in a situation whereby there's flush with liquidity, financial markets are higher than ever. At the same time, there's a lot of poverty out there. Now, the, 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 the issues is that, you know, let me first start with the big picture, right? The big picture is that we have four global injustices staring us in the face. And the first one, of course, is the pandemic vaccinations. Rich countries, high-income countries, 30% of the citizens have already received at least one dose. This is according to WHO data, okay? And 87% of the vaccines that are available have been paid for and going to the rich countries. You know, the, some of the poor countries don't even have 1% vaccinated, okay? 1% vaccinated. And, 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 and so this is, this is a, you know, the poor might not be able to get them latest by 2023. And we've already into the third wave uh, of the pandemic. So this is a huge, you know, uh, injustice. You know, people who have, have the highest problems, you know, can't get their health right, can't get lose their jobs. And of course, you know, if you really then go into the geopolitical issue, military spending is two trillion dollars annually. Okay, last year actually increased by nearly four percent worldwide. In a situation when the world economy was going down by four percent. And the whole global net development aid to the poor countries is only 168 billion. Now, the IMF has calculated if you want to provide vaccines to all the poor countries, it'll cost you $50 billion, which is peanuts compared to the total of money we want to spend fighting each other. The third injustice is that the rich are getting richer, you know, partly because of quantitative easing, 
the global high net worth uh, individuals, those who own more than net $1 million each, you know, has increased by 6.3%. Uh, 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 and their wealth increased by 7.6% to own $80 trillion. That's nearly 90% of the world GDP. They own that amount of money, okay? And, and But at the same time, the World Bank has estimated last year and this year, there may be 110 to 150 million people going into extreme poverty. And now those of you who are in Europe who suffered the latest floods, you see the floods in India, you see the floods in China, you see the forest fires in California, the freak typhoons, the melting of the Arctic permafrost in, in Siberia, you know, the, 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 the forest fires in Amazon. We are in big climate change disaster, right? So the, 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 the issue is, you know, what are we going to do about it? And, and look at this, right? Central bank balance sheet last year, between 2020 to now, that's $9 trillion, okay? Bump, all right? And then, you know, the, the, the S&P 500 is completely tracks the central bank balance sheet numbers, okay? And so the, 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 the wealth effect, you all know this from the Branco Elephant Curve, uh, uh, the rich capture 27% of top growth. Now, the BIS, which is the central bank of central banks, in a, to, in, a, in, a, in a sense, which is based in Basel, their latest annual report, already says very somberly that central banks are concerned with distributional effects of monetary policy. What it means is that central bank monetary policy creates inequality. And those are the numbers that are showing. The Gini, wealth Gini numbers have increased almost everywhere. Poverty rates have been resolved partly because of uh, uh, different policies, but the wealth Gini is, is, is widening. And of course, the lower interest rates creates higher as asset prices and create that uh, interest rate wealth. So what is the implications of that money on the unfolding political and climate change issues? Well, if you look at what's happened, you know, since, since, since 2000, the, 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 the non-bank financial intermediaries, that means the shadow banks, are now larger than the banking system, okay? And, and, and out of the $400 billion, trillion dollars of financial assets, Central banks already account for 30.5, and that's 2019. So you add the nine, that's $40 billion. 10% of the world's financial system are central banks. They used to be only 2%, okay? And so, you know, the, 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 the whole financial landscape has changed. And that doesn't include cyber currencies uh, in this, which uh, Mike will talk about. Now, a lot of this is due to, you know, the US uh, growth in debt. And, 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 and the CBO, and this is before the uh, last year's, uh, um, you know, COVID uh, prime pumping, uh, U.S. debt might grow 152% of GDP uh, by 2048. And the, the world economy actually is driven by the U.S. dollar, which accounts for, you know, uh, 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 literally 44% or 88% of the paired currency uh, tran transactions. Uh, uh, and also, you know, 60% uh, of foreign exchange reserves, right? Uh, but in, in recent years, if you look at that chart by OFAC, the Office of the Foreign Asset Control, U.S. sanctions against foreigners holding through the U.S. dollar payment system has just shot through the roof. And that has gone up even further with the U.S.-China sanctions. And if that happens, people are saying, well, if I'm going to be sanctioned by, by just by using the dollar, let me move to something else. That's what's been driving also the, exist, the, the survival of the Bitcoin, cyber currencies, Ethereum, etc. So we actually have a situation which everybody knows uh, is to some extent unsustainable, right? That we have a lot of liquidity at the short end of the market. But the amount of money that is able to deal with green financing, uh, you know, to, 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 to deal with the uh, forest fires, to deal with inequality, to, to, to help, you know, cope with climate change, you know, that money is not available. Okay. So we now, I'm going to very quickly run through this economics of information and what money really is. Well, we are all in networks, right? And, and networks have, you know, Metcalfe's law, you know, uh, the value of a network you know, goes up to the square of the number of users. And that's why the tech plat platforms have done very well. And what is digital currency? Well, digital currency, you know, previously used to be cash, right? 
and uh, 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 and that you know when the banking system got a good was bank reserves, but when it got electronic, okay, you then get Bitcoin, you get peer to peer transactions, which is two min, which is the alternative currency, and to a large extent, alternative currencies can be produced by the private sector as alternate to central bank issued money, which is fundamentally called fiat money. That is legally protected money, okay, right? Now, but information is a property right. And if there's no information, there's no market. So the more, the more knowledge you put into money, right, the more sophisticated it is, it has value. And that's exactly what's Bitcoin, right? So if you think about, you know, money as information and energy, what's a banking system? We put money deposits into a bank. And a bank is exactly like a battery. It stores that value. And if they have non-performing loans, the shadow banking, stealing of the money, corruption, et cetera, you know, the, the banks may collapse and just destroy value. Okay. So to a large extent, the deposits are the value you earn from your income. And then you, you, you store it in, in, in banking system, and then it gets recycled in credit, et cetera. And that is exactly what's happening through the Bitcoin. So if you really think about it, a, 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 you know, a financial system is a network that links ledgers. The value is transferred from account to account. Now, in the traditional uh, 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 central bank system, it's a, it's a hierarchy, it's a pyramid, right? Bank A, you know, your bank transfer money to my bank. I give my money to my bank. I tell my bank to transfer the money to your bank. Now, if, if you are in America and I'm in Malaysia, I ask my bank to instruct JP Morgan to transfer to your bank, Citibank, via the books of the Fed. So in a sense, that hierarchy, the Fed can see everything. But what's a distributed ledger system? It's a very flat system. The information goes from through the blockchain from one ledger to the other on a very flat basis, completely encrypted in every single source. So today, financial technology is blockchain plus artificial intelligence plus big data plus apps. And if the set governments can do it, the private sector can do it. So in a sense, we are facing a new French revolution in the sense that the people have decided they want to create their own currency as an alternative to central bank government money. So we have moved from M0, central bank base money, to commercial bank deposits, M1, include fixed deposits, M2, to non-bank deposits, M3, to deposit substitutes, M4, and now M5 includes cyber currency, okay? So, you know, and if you really look, read at Goldman Sachs' latest, you know, report on cyber currency or cryptocurrency, you know, the value of cryptocurrency at its peak this year was $1.2 trillion. That's one half of the value of official gold at today's market price. Cyber currency achieved this in 10 years, okay? Before 2009, you know, when uh, Nakamoto, Satoshi Nakamoto started writing about, you know, uh, cyber currencies, nobody heard of it. Today, it has a value, half the value of the value of gold, which was money since man, you know, uh, uh, has, has, has invented uh, gold coins, right? So to a large extent, you know, cyber currencies is now an alternative currency, okay? And, but a lot of it is used for capital flight. If you are a refugee escaping from, let's say, Syria, would you be carrying gold? Would you be carrying US dollars? Or would you be buying some cyber currency like Bitcoin and you just carry your passwords in your head and so that when you get to the next computer, you know, you can actually access that money, okay? If you're not, you're going to be robbed or, 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 or whatever. So cyber currency or rather central bank digital currency is now the counterattack or the defense mechanism of central banks to create currencies to maintain their monopoly or their dominance uh, over the cyber currency issue. And uh, Bordeaux uh, 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 and, and Levin has written about this, so I'm not going to go too much in detail. But central banks are trying to phase out paper currency. 
uh, and they are all also looking at how this affects you know uh, monetary policy per se, right? Uh, so uh, uh, the latest experiment is between the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, where I used to be deputy chief executive. Uh, it has a joint research experiment with the Bank of Thailand on wholesale central bank uh, digital currencies, and this is going to be widened to include the uh, United Arab uh, Emirates uh, called a Lion uh, Rock project. And they're moving from basically wholesale uh, central bank currencies to retail, okay? And this is the mechanism how it's going to work, all right? It, it is going to show how, you know, the, where the benefits are. And the major benefits on a cross-border basis if you use to, if you try to use money through PayPal or or or, or, or any of the other, you know, uh, uh, the cross-border payments mechanism, the margin is actually quite high. You 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 pay for a service fee and you pay in a, in in terms of the the the, the bid ask spread, the margin, you know, in in that rate. And so, if you actually can use a, a CBDC exchange models, you might be able to do it faster and cheaper. Uh, and more reliable, put it this way. So to a large extent, money in the age of imagination is also a crisis of the imagination. You know, you know we have now thought through you know, the idea that we can create money other than central banks. But the current global financial system is still very much US dollar based, okay? But the weaponization of that finance because of geopolitical rivalry creates huge problems for national policy. And so, and, and we can see that central banks have been very effective change agencies in the age of QE. Without the power of quantitative easing, we couldn't have tackled the, the pandemic in, 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 in that scaling up of uh, government expenditure, okay? So that is a huge power. But central banks are now, you know, still very conservative, very prudent. They want to stick to their mandate. Uh, and they're beginning to think about how to deal with social inclusivity, addressing climate change, and the, 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 the opportunities as well as the threats from technology. So how central banks will become thought leadership in this year is uncertain. And it's very clear in my mind, the work done by YSI into new thinking using cyber currencies to create the human capital network is certainly the way to go. So let me stop here and pass it over to Mike. Thank you. Jeez, wow. Well, thank you so much for that presentation, Mr. Shang. It's as much as I love economics, there's always that little bit of, there's always that side of economics that makes your heart sink a little bit. Of seeing uh, what we're in for, and if things don't change, it's going to be a pretty bleak future. But uh, so, yeah, why don't I get right into it? As uh, Mr. Shang was saying, uh, my project actually rolls right off of that last slide. I am uh, working on a project called the Human Capital Network, and we are essentially trying to create a private money that can uh, solve some of these issues. Uh, let me just get my screen share here. Oops. All right, sorry, can everybody see that? Alrighty, so I wanted to start by recapping on our last couple of sessions. Uh, our first one with Dr. Georgina Gomez. So we have learned that currency plurality can complement the, ne the neglected aspects of a larger economy. Money that is designed for a specific purpose can create a sort of sub-economy specific to the needs of the people participating within. Currency plurality also adds resilience to an economy and lessens crises often felt with a monocurrency economy. And from session two with uh, Professor James A. Robinson, we have been introduced to the core mechanics of why nations fail, the importance of inclusive institutions needed to counter extractive ones. Classically, money has been paid for through imperialist expansion and the claiming of resources in a new territory. This is awful. Our money culture, believe it or not, is still rooted in this formula of extraction, as uh, Mr. Sheng's presentation showed, often taking the form of debt bondage and exportation of wealth. That being said, if we were to redesign money here and now to serve our needs as a species, 
And what would it look like? And I want to pitch this question to the whole YSI community. So the ingredients we're working with is it must provide economic resilience, aka we are designing a complementary currency. It must also have a specific purpose. We want to foster inclusion and defend Spaceship Earth. Inclusive institutions can fight extractive ones. And further, the, one of the biggest ones, we have to prevent the Leviathan problem. So not only are we combating extractive institutions, we have to make sure we do not become the new Federal Reserve if we're doing something on this scale. So let's cook, to use a popular phrase, although we are cooking a complementary currency. Now, I like this quote from last week's session from Professor Robinson, what generates prosperity is not a mystery. So to give our community or complementary currency economic value, we will tie it to the same elements that we have discovered generate prosperity. And there's a quick note, there are already are a few altcoins that focus only on altruism and fair exchange, such as fair coin and social coin. But despite noble values, they are relatively underused. Social coin, I believe, has disappeared altogether, unfortunately. And so that shows that it can't just have that altruistic value, it does also have to have economic value. So we can design our complementary currency on the Ethereum blockchain. And for those who know me, I love the concept of cryptocurrency more than I love investing in it, just because the concept of programmable money is fascinating to me. So this provides global access, providing it's uh, internet capable and has proven to be trustworthy and it keeps community currencies accountable to the community, which you know is inclusive. And Ethereum smart contracts can perform to function with very little cost. So the question now begins, we've, we're designing our engine. So how do, we, how do we distribute the money to the people? Now, traditional mining comes from verifying transactions on the blockchain. However, this is competitive, which has led to uh, some new uh, economic or environmental crises. And it is still supply controlled, which is one of the areas where fiat fails. So our mining, to borrow that term, comes from individual progress in human capital development and democratic institutions, two of the major aspects of building prosperity. So, okay, now we have a purpose-driven currency, but what does it complement? So, Unemployment, as we're all economists here, we all know, unemployment destroys a nation's economy. And this is a global issue. It's not just in uh, the United States, Asia, or Europe. So governments need to recoup money through taxation, but the unemployed need additional support, <laughs> which creates even greater debt that isn't being paid. And there's just a minor note there, 2020 alone saw global debt rise by 24 trillion US dollars, according to the Financial Post. Uh, and to create and attract jobs, governments often lose bargaining power. You've all heard of the race to the bottom. Come build here and we'll let you pollute our rivers. No, come build here and we'll let you exploit our labor. That's, uh, <laughs> we've had some issues like that in Canada recently from province to province. And that being said, so much relies on jobs, but technology is improving rapidly. And although new technology does provide new jobs, it displaces previous workers faster than ever. And the side effects of unemployment include depression, health problems, increase in homelessness and crime, mass migration, which can cause some social tensions. And I don't have to explain to everybody here why unemployment is bad. So our role as a complementary currency will be to significantly reduce unemployment and replace it at the same time with human capital development and democratic development. Because we exist as an online entity, seen here in the middle of the ocean, our cryptocurrency can be mined anywhere with an internet connection and, and distributed cost-free. So this allows our tokens to be delivered directly to the participant who then cashes it for fiat in their chosen countries. The government that caches the cryptocurrency destroys our tokens, retains a small percentage of the newly issued fiat, and delivers the remainder to the participant. I know that's probably invoking some questions, so bear with me. This is duly beneficial, as each nation is not only receiving a new source of income for financing their <laughs> heavily uh, indebted fiat, but its greatest liability, unemployment, is now an asset. 
Unemployment is reduced, and the overall stock of human capital available is constantly in increasing. We are strong where fiat is weak, but since we are limited to our specific purpose, we do not replace or compete with fiat. Thus, we have the capacity to serve as a global complementary currency. Part two, this is answering some of the questions that uh, you might be thinking, the civic economy and how to shackle the Leviathan. So if we've been talking about why fiat money is so extractive and so terrible, why the hell do we want to complement it? Why not get rid of it? So this system still puts people at the mercy of the government. How can we make sure participants are getting a fair deal? How do we stop this influx of money ending up in the hands of the ultra wealthy? Aren't cryptocurrencies bad for the environment? How will we mend and defend Spaceship Earth? So my biggest answer to that is the civic economy. Recall, we are also supplying tokens to individuals for their participation in democratic institutions. This ensures that citizens receive a civic education in all matters pertaining to them. On a basic level, voters must understand their representatives, what the party stands for, a history of action. We also encourage people to go up another level and learn political sciences, as well as another special sector such as economics, social science, or history. How this will be accomplished is still being designed. Admittedly, this is still a whiteboard project in many ways, but we are hoping to consult political scientists and engineers to build a program that deals with more of the universal laws of democracy, as well as, well as network some local institutions to engage people on issues directly affecting them. At the end of the day, though, our goal is to strengthen individual knowledge and democratic engagement thereby creating strong and inclusive political institutions. Now, if this is achievable, it solves many issues surrounding poor fiat production and unfair taxation. After all, uninformed and empowered people can hold democracy's reins. They can ensure that taxes are just, pre prevent political extraction, and over time adjust fiat to perform only where it is best and not as an all-purpose currency. Uh, for those who have read Dr. Gomez's book, all-purpose currencies, even though they like to claim they are all-purpose, are not. So, the Leviathan problem in Spaceship Earth, and don't let this cute little guy fool you, he's incredibly dangerous. So, if this project is successful, it will become a new Leviathan. So, consider what we have learned about inclusive institutions, how inclusive institutions prevent and destroy extractive ones, so our initiative is designed to be completely answerable to its users all over the world, from the cryptocurrency being run by the Ethereum community to the institutions that we partner with. Our treasury will be funded by the users, and although we take a tiny fee from each payment made, the users will always have the ability to stop the payments at any time. The only true way to get a Leviathan to comply is to stop feeding it. The treasury does not belong entirely to us either, but it is a separate entity used to entice other academic institutions to join us in the creation and fostering of global public goods. So potential additions to this, what we've just been referring to as the greater network, must also be willing to honor inclusive development, spaceship earth, and the values voted on by our community. We are trying to bake democratic institution into the framework of this private money. All partners of this greater network must offer complete corporate transparency. We're not here to dictate maximum salaries, but everything must be available to a public audit. We believe that uh, there's that classic idea of the traveling salesman who is just a shyster because, well, they've got no reputation. So we are doing this on the basis that if people can hold you accountable and auditable, you will perform better. So it is our hope that through this platform, we may be able to make an inclusive global network capable of removing entrenched, extractive institutions over time. So, and uh, to quote our uh, wonderful speaker today from a little segment called This Is Your Wake Up Call, we are using incomplete concepts to explain a much more complex, much more nuanced human being in a new world. A new world of technology, a new world of climate change, a new world of social inequality that we have to address. Admittedly, this presentation is a little more focused on the mechanics of our initiative, and there is more to be explored in human capital development beyond its economic value. A deeper part of this initiative is the development of the human being itself. In his book, Why, What Makes Us Curious, astrophysicist Mario Livio discusses the impact that curiosity, plain and simple 
curiosity has had on our entire evolution as a species. From da Vinci to Einstein, history's greatest thinkers have been ruled by their insatiable appetite to ask why. While our goals may be economic in their engineering, it is our belief that by giving as many people in the world as possible a sandbox for their curiosity, we will see leaps in our civilization that just yesterday seemed unimaginable. Belief in this is also part of our economic formula. The technologies of tomorrow create the value for the currency we are issuing today. In the working paper, I equate Livio's curiosity to an extension of Adam Smith's invisible hand. The slideshow, my original, original plenary video, and the working paper will be available to anyone who would like a copy for further discussion. As I try to develop this, this is still a working hypothesis by turning it into an actual company. I am grateful for all reviews and criticism. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mike. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that means a uh, lot to me. Yes. Uh, well, there are a, 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 a lot of questions. How, how, how do you want to play this conversation? Yeah, well, I guess uh, uh, we should... Uh, I think if so I, I may, thank you, if Christine. I may, <laughs> fantastic. Um, I think at this point, uh, Mr. Sheng, if you can maybe give your feedback on Mike's presentation, um, and then after your comments, then we'll then open it up uh, to the um, to the audience for questions. And I've already lined up. I think Walid will be the first to go once we get into the discussion with the audience. Um, but at this point, Mr. Sheng, if you could give some feedback, criticism, um, ideas uh, on on Mike's presentation, uh, we'll then proceed after that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I think, Mike, you know, uh, um, I haven't had a chance to, you know, think through uh, in great depth, but I see where you're trying to get at. Uh, and the key question is, are you trying to put too much into one project? Okay. Because, you know, the, the, the issues of uh, uh, in, uh, human inclusivity, uh, climate change are big, big issues. All right. And you know the 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 the, the as, as I was trying to point out, you know, whatever you try to do when you're trying something new, the establishment that means the people who already control the money are going to say, "Are you a threat to me?" Right? It's a political question, right? It's a competition question, and therefore, you know, uh, 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 what has happened as you've already seen that the you know there have been official crackdowns. On that has affected cyber currencies, uh, which has causes massive volatility out there, right? Mm -hmm. But the mining of these cyber currencies at the moment is for people to get rich. Some of them, which may be even Ponzi schemes or scams, we don't know, right? I mean, that 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 this is an issue that is really open, right? So you know, exactly like the French Revolution, uh, there are many people out there who have many different ideas. And what will succeed out of this is not yet clear. So your idea is very innovative and I like it very much. Now, what I like particularly about what you are exploring right now is at the core of what is money, okay? So, you know, money is both an asset and a liability, right? You are creating a cyber currency which would be an asset, right? And of course, you know, there are assets which are tokens and they don't have liabilities, right? But if they don't have liabilities, uh, they say, who is this owned by? I mean, who's, whose liability is this? At least we know in central bank cyber currency, this is a liability of the central bank. The, the central bank has the full faith of the government and the government is the representative of all of us. Theoretically, we vote in all the, all the representatives who then appoint uh, the, the, the government, who then appoints the central bank governor, and then who then actually issues the money, okay? But what, what, what is happening is that you're saying that, well, you know, a bunch of us, we feel that we can use blockchain uh, technology and create a Ethereum-based platform, and we will issue these assets. And these assets, as you say, will then be uh, issued uh, to create jobs. All this 
nobody has an object to, ob objection to. The, 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 the key point that you have made, which I like very much, and which is at the heart of the, it all, is, that, is, is what has been proven as what I was trying to say in this, this last lecture, that the central banks have proven that if you create money against an underutilized asset, which is unemployment, okay? Unemployment is strictly speaking, available but unpaid labor, right? Okay, I mean, that's what it is, right? You know, if, if, if I'm unemployed and you give me money to do something, I'll be happy to work for you. I mean, you know, there's a subject to the laws of contract, you know, labor contract, right? Okay, and so, but, but your issue of that uh, 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 coin or, or, or mining of that money, what law protects it? What law protects that user? Is it national law? Is it global law? That becomes a political question because no law is passed without some politics. I mean, that's the, that's the reality of politics as such, right? Christina, who's, who's done law, would know this, okay? <laughs> because, you know, uh, money is actually a social construct and all social construct involve politics. Okay, and that's why economics, forgetting its political economy, doesn't work. Okay, it, it, it really ultimately becomes a, a political question. But the core concept to use that money against available labor, but unpaid at this moment, and then it gets paid, actually generates a public good. That is. Is, is completely in line with what Keynes said during the, 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 the Great Depression. The government can pay some people to dig a hole and pay somebody to fill that hole again. And then the GDP will go up and then they will have wages. And because they have the wages, they will spend it and they spend the wages. Some other people will get, a, get, get jobs. And then the whole thing has a multiplier effect and then the whole economy gets itself out of the recession. So the, the whole concept of using that money to, to, to deploy uh, available labor, but is underutilized and unpaid is completely correct. But the, the modus operandi of how you actually get everybody to accept that money, you know, money as money is a very interesting question, okay? Because, you know, it's, 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 it's it, uh, very frankly speaking, you know, the, the central banks are beginning to discover and, and which is what uh, uh, Facebook tried to do through uh, Libra, right? If, every, if there are 2 billion people out there who use Facebook and I issue a currency called Libra, my currency is more, I've got 2 million customers. Right? Why do I need to use dollars or, or, or whatever? And the same with Amazon, right? If Amazon said, I create an Amazon token in which every time you buy from Amazon, you'll be given one extra token. That's equivalent of calling mining. It's like miles, points, you know, points by miles, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, you know, uh, you know, and then with that points, you can buy a discount from Amazon again, you know, that is again, some form of money because the Amazon customers, you know, feel that they, 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 you know, they, they paid for it in the sense that, you know, they're actually using, you know, Amazon services. So, you know, you know, the, the object of this, you know, not-for-profit mining exercise is very laudable the key question then is how do you convince the users, the intermediaries, the powers that be, the establishment, that you know you will deliver what you promise to do. Okay, and then you will get into very much like and uh, what is called a startup venture capital. You will go through the exercise of pilot you know, experimentation, 
uh, proof of concept, you know, proof by uh, 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 design, uh, prototyping, and then roll out, and then eventually, you know, what that happens. So, and, and, and remember this, this will, you know, obviously this is not for profit. So somebody will have to, you know, kind of finance this particular project to start it off. And then eventually it can be done with experimentation, particularly maybe in the emerging markets, which, which, which laws are much more flexible in that regard. And that will allow that, you know, to be done. But it will need credibility in the sense that you will have people behind it who, are, who, who have uh, transparency, accountability, credibility, et cetera, so that this is not going to be another of the kind of fly-by-night cyber currency scam issues, as it were, okay? So if it can be done, it will be, you know, very laudable. Uh, 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 and and I, 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 I think we obviously... You've raised some of the questions, but I'm just giving you some of my experience as a former central banker and re regulator of what the, some of the issues are. Let me just oh, stop here. Uh, believe me, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Your, uh, everything you have to say is so insightful. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the work you do. What can I say? All right. All right. So, fantastic. Oh, sorry. Great, thank I was you. just going to say, why don't we hand it over to you and uh, you can show us what uh, questions we've got. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mr. Sheng and Mike, for um, very interesting um, uh, presentations. And um, Mr. Sheng, for the feedback as well, which I think is going to get us into a very lively discussion. Um, I think first up, we'll call on Walid Adas uh, to give some feedback. And then there after, after, I'll pose a question from Clara. And if there are any other questions, please continue to post them in the chat or raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question directly. Uh, but over to you, Walid. Uh, unmute. <laughs> Sorry, Walid, uh, unmute. Sorry. There we go. Once again, thank you very much, uh, Christina, uh, Andrew, Michael, and everyone. I'm really honored to be for the first time here as, uh, with you. Uh, and I really I just have a comment. Uh, uh, basically, all the presentations are really great, uh, but they address uh, very, very big, wick, wicked subjects, you know, wicked subjects, quote unquote. I mean, climate change, the pandemic, the military spending, these are huge subjects really. And I really want us to, to if you don't mind, you might hear something now, first time, maybe it's a bit new. And this idea of moving away from the mainstream uh, positive economics, basically, uh, I'm, I'm from Jeddah here, uh, from the Islamic Development Bank. And uh, as you know, we are all human beings. Uh, we have a purpose in this world, in this life. As long as we keep God out of our discussion and discourse, uh, because in, in our worldview, God is the real owner of everything, including us, including our uh, thoughts, our actions, He's actually the, uh, behind all of that. As long as we keep him out of our discourse, we will continue, uh, you know, uh, in piecemeal uh, solutions. Because God is the real owner uh, of, of money, of wealth, of oh, everything. And he has, and I'm using the word he because he's genderless, but we, I mean, he just to make an uh, idea. He has given us this opportunity in this world to be a trust. So he has entrusted us with this wealth and this money to see how we will spend it and in what uh, way we will uh, help the poor or maybe uh, do something good uh, instead of corrupting the earth. Today, as uh, Andrew said, with the climate change, man has corrupted the earth with the unemployment, with the poverty going back now after the pandemic, we are back now, I think, 10 years in the past. All the progress that has been done in the sustainable development goals, we've lost, I think, three years under extreme poverty. So what I'm trying to say, as long as there is no morality in money, and that's what's happening today, if we don't have morality in money, the way, the way we earn money and the way we spend it, if there is no ethical norms and morality at the global level, 
we we are doomed for uh, you know continuous uh, trial and error trial and error and financial crisis will be will continue to hit us every seven years uh, to clean all this mess and then we start all of it all over again trial and error so i'm just calling here for coming back as adam smith he used to say uh, he has the theory of moral sentiments we need to bring ethics and morality back into our our life uh, whether you like to name it god or something else of course it is all up to your own belief system but i believe that we are not created here for a gameplay there is a purpose for all of us in this life and if we do not apply morality and ethics in in the way we we deal with our money the way we earn it and the way we create it uh, then we will continue hitting this, uh, this wall. So this is, uh, you know, maybe it's a grand uh, introduction here. It's, it's a bit of a shock maybe to hear this. Uh, but honestly, uh, this pandemic has made many people come back and return to God. Now, how, what do we mean by God? That's another story. It's not in the realm of economic uh, science and economic discourse. But really, I, am, I would like to call for morality back into economics, behavioral economics, as you all know. And we should all behave ourselves. Uh, because, for example, Michael, you are linking it with democracies. I mean, half of the world are autocratic. Uh, they, you know, developing, uh, I mean, they are not democratic. So what would you do for the poor people who mostly in Africa live in autocratic uh, regimes? I don't want to, you know, uh, elaborate more. So what I'm trying to say is we, we really need to have ethical leadership, ethical uh, standards. I, I lived and worked in Malaysia for almost five years at the regional hub there in Kuala Lumpur. And I remember Mahathir, uh, Muhammad Mahathir, he had a very uh, grand idea about the gold dinar. I, I'm not for the gold dinar or the gold coin back to the gold uh, standard. But maybe I will leave Andrew maybe to shed light on that. But really, uh, creating money out of thin air uh, is not sustainable and is no longer sustainable. And because the dollar is the, the, the major currency in the, in the world today, USA can afford to print and print and print, but the mountains and mountains of debt, we will all pay oh. the price one day. I'm sorry, oh. maybe it's a bit of a doomsday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Walid, for, for your reflections. Uh, and before we get into a response for those, I think we'll maybe take uh, the question in the chat. Um, we'll go to Clara's question. Um, uh, so her question is, my question relates to what Andrew Sheng just outlined. Um, who should use your currency, Michael? And more importantly, why would you assume they, they use it? Isn't it a political decision that must be taken on a greater level in order to ensure its broad recognition? And so I think it relates to um, uh, Mr. Sheng's presentation at the end where uh, you, your feedback was on the fact that this is a political question, where's the political will? And so maybe that is something that Mike can respond to a little bit later on. And then lastly, um, from Adam, uh, um, I have a question for Professor Sheng. Uh, could he explain his FinTech definition more deeply? Um, I think it is where on the one slide you had the combination of, uh, yeah, with AI big data um, that that combination so maybe if we can go into that a little bit more deeply so let's do the first round of questions so Walid's question with regards to morality and money into Clara's question uh, to Mike regarding political uh, will and then uh, Mr. Sheng if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on fintech uh, let me let me try and tackle uh, 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 Walid's question I think um, the, the 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 pandemic has uh, evoked the same um, awareness. I uh, when I was a securities regulator, uh, I used to preach corporate governance, and then I stopped because uh, there was Sabin's Oxley. Did it stop all the scams that went on? It didn't. Okay, uh, when uh, uh, some of the leading investment bankers in the world, uh, we shall not mention any names. Uh, they claim that the, uh, you know, they are not greedy, uh, but they have been fined uh, billions uh, for their um, shenanigans, put it this way, all right? Uh, and did that, did that stop? Um, for one of the major investment banks, 
which has involved in billions of dollars uh, of losses for one of its clients uh, and for which it paid billions of dollars uh, in, in, uh, uh, in settlement. Uh, the bonus cut uh, for the CEO was relatively minor, put it this way. So uh, when this happens in one of the most advanced markets in the world, I gave up talking about morality. Okay, the, 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 the issue is that, of course, morality is very much individual uh, in the sense that if you decide to be moral, uh, that's fine. But somebody else may decide not to be immoral and that's his or her prerogative. That's the unfortunate part of society. But while it is absolutely correct, the issue is every decision we make it's not a military decision. It's not a monetary decision. It's not an economic decision. It's not a social decision. It's not a political decision. Ultimately, it is a moral decision. Okay? So that, in that sense, you know, it's the, 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 the encompassing issue is every decision we make has a moral impact on somebody else or on Mother Earth. And as long as we live by our belief, rightly or wrongly, that we can exploit other human beings, uh, cheat and lie, and also destroy Mother Earth for our own personal benefit, then that is immoral. Okay? Th that part is fairly clear. But the reality that we face is that there are a lot of immoral people out there. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, and why are we worried about Leviathans? That's because of the immorality. And, and we mustn't forget that it is we collectively that have created this immoral, immorality on other human beings uh, and on Mother Nature. Okay? And that's why we now have the revenge of the, uh, the mutiny of the people and the mutiny of nature, right? That the, 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 the climate disasters that we are seeing, the pollution, all these are actually reactions to our behavior. Now, but I am not a moral, I am not, I, I don't even claim to be a moral person, okay? I, you know, because that I leave to uh, 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 history to judge, all right, or to 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 to, to God to, to to judge. I am I, you know, uh, uh, my 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 own view is that as long as I try not to do harm to others, uh, uh, that's what is what is important. The 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 the, the issue that I have I've come I've begun to realize is that we have been divided into silos. Rather than understanding that we are part of a collective whole, we, we have put into silos. And in fact, Adam Smith used the pin factory to actually specialize. But the minute we become specialized, we actually do not see the whole. And we forget about the whole. And so that's why if you only read the wealth of nations, you forget that Adam Smith was a moral philosopher first and foremost. And in fact, he should not have been writing about the wealth of nations because a nation is a part. He should have talked about the wealth of the world. Uh, recently, uh, uh, Partha Dasgupta has written what I considered the most important book after Thomas Piketty's uh, 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 on capitalism, which is called the economics of biodiversity. Okay, and 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 we have not priced human natural capital uh, into uh, uh, in, in, into economics, right? And the United Nations have only just begun to take into consideration the value of natural capital into the uh, GDP calculations, even though the SNA was designed in 1953, right? So to a large extent, 
I don't really understand the nomenc nomenclature of, of, of domination. By nature, capitalism values capital over labor. So are you surprised when you overvalue capital, labor doesn't count, human beings don't count. And then on top of that, you don't even count nature into capital. What do you expect? You actually exploit man and nature for individual profit, not for collective well-being. Okay? And that's where economics now needs to be broadened, go back to its, uh, its meta roots. We are facing ultimately not a political crisis, not a military crisis, not a geopolitical crisis, but a moral crisis of humanity and its relationship with nature itself. So Walid, I agree with you, but I, you know, I, uh, uh, it, it is, it is a bigger issue that we are now struggling with. Now, you know, on Adam uh, uh, Karenyi's uh, 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 question about the definition of fintech, of course, the definition of fintech is, is, is financial technology. You know, any technology that is related uh, 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 to finance, as it were, it's a very broad term. But what I really meant was that, you know, if you then break down where is financial technology innovation, it is broken down into three parts, AI, big data, and apps, as it were, okay, right? And, 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 and so, you know, if you, if, if you have, uh, 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 you build in the, 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 the algorithms into AI, which analyzes the big data, you then use the apps to convince your consumers to use your platform you're the big winner according to Metcalf's law. And that's, it. that's what everybody is using fin, uh, FinTech uh, to achieve their market profit or whatever objectives. I hope that's useful, Adam. Thank you. That is very useful. Thank you so much, Professor Shen. Great, thank you so much, Professor Shen. I'm not sure if at this point, Mike, would you maybe like to give uh, your reflections and then I'll call on Jay to pose a question. Uh, thank you, Larissa, for joining us. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, I was just going over uh, Clara's question again. And well, first I just wanted to uh, reflect on uh, Waleed. That's, I almost think we could do another webinar entirely on uh, morality in in economics, and if we do, sign me up because I would love to be a part of that. Uh, but to go on to Clara's question, my currency would be directed to the same sort of people that a UBI would target. In fact, we're uh, one of my original projections for this was essentially an evolution of the Universal Basic Income Project uh, because we want to we want to give people enough money to compete with their part-time job or their low-income job. Um, you know, uh, I didn't get into too much detail in the slideshow, but one of the issues with the job economy is that it kind of destroys what a lot of conservatives, or at least, sorry, I'm speaking of to my Canadian conservatives, um, considered to be the free market. Because if people don't have any bargaining power, there is no such thing as the free market. You can't you know, uh, to speak back to Adam Smith, uh, his whole, there's a quote I love from him, and it's, uh, the employer can persuade the worker to come and bargain. Uh, but if you have a student debt, or you just have to pay your rent, you've got no bargaining power, you have to take what's given to you. And even on, uh, on the more liberal side of things, when the, you know, the government tries to control things with its broad stroke uh, like minimum wages and certain things. And these end up destroying smaller businesses that might have been able to take on these Leviathans. But so I don't want to digress too much, but that would be my currency would be directed towards these people who find themselves in a dead end job or an unrewarding job or uh, finding themselves exploited and don't have enough money to make their to make the, the lower end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's something we get into in the working paper as well. Uh, so why would I assume they use it? Well, this is where good old fashioned market competition comes into things. And, but it does require, 
uh, a closed ecosystem, unfortunately. So until we can get that, we kind of exist in this neat hiatus because anybody can launch a cryptocurrency and it's a speculative asset. Uh, it's like the whole NFT craze. Like I drew a picture or I have a hockey card and people are speculating on it, et cetera, et cetera. But so to get people to use it, you've got to make it worth their while. So we are essentially, hey, this is what UBI accomplishes. Excellent. We can accomplish what UBI does and then some. And so we, we give people that incentive and then we try to encourage. Uh, right now, I am petitioning the Canadian government uh, to be our, uh, the end of our, or the redeemer part of our ecosystem. And that is how I changed it to that method after learning about how complementary currencies work. And so if we have that closed ecosystem, then there is an incentive for people to use it. And now we have more competition for the job economy. So people can actually, once again, have that right to bargain. And <sighs> sorry, I want to make sure I'm staying on topic there. Uh, they have that right to bargain, but it also has to appeal. You've got to tickle the king's belly. To use, <laughs> to use an old idiom, uh, to make sure they're getting their cut. And then, well, that puts us in that disadvantage of, okay, now we're like a secondary thing, but we're, and this is where we take uh, the leap of faith where, okay, if we're investing in human capital development and investing in uh, voter awareness and political know-how, eventually people will be able, if this system is successful, because it is still a hypothesis we're trying to test, people will be able to start you know, uh, cutting into politi uh, the political powers, uh, the powers that be, and give this more, more of a floor. But this is what I'm setting up will probably take a generation or two to really fully realize itself. But that is my hope for the initiative. I hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, and now I'll hand over to Jay uh, for the last question of the session. Unless there are any other questions, uh, please raise your hand or post them in the chat. If there aren't, then uh, Jay, can you please pose a question? Well, thanks, first of all. And congratulations again, Christina and Mike, for setting up the series and Andrew today for, for coming on. So first of all, let me just, in my own words, try to summarize uh, what I believe has been the core problem we're trying to solve uh, that, that Andrew and also Mike have all been alluding to. And then give me, give a, a small, a small sort of reading um, in Andrew's style. I really love how Andrew brings this comprehensive view to, to, to the problem and how to solve it is another question, but I just want to make sure we're clear about the, the objective. Um, so we, uh, what, what Andrew has, uh, has been pointed to in his presentation is that we essentially are in a collective action problem. It's not from lack of means, we are, it's a lack of actual uh, coordination at various different uh, levels. So that's the first thing we have to understand and understanding what role money can play for a coordination mechanism or not. And so here's, here were a lot of different proposals or uh, pr perspectives come to play. Like how do we bring coordination uh, that is truly inclusive uh, into play? Um, that's, that's the big question of the day. And the problem is that the layers uh, that we have are so multifaceted. Uh, there's clear political power that is entrenched in government and private business uh, and in, in the global north over the global south and, and so forth. And uh, in the established currencies, primarily the dollar versus uh, other secondary currencies. So that's the, the, the playing field. We can't, we can't uh, wish that away. That's what we're, we're, we're dealing with. And so in the past, uh, and that's my, my big question that I've had been thinking about for the last year or two is all reform efforts uh, so, sort of add to this complexity by adding another institution or another set of things to an already existing infrastructure. And we haven't had a war where everything's eradicated and we start from zero. So we have to sort of live within the existing infrastructure and maybe reform it. And therefore also all the proposals have a little a bit of, um, of their, a, a perspective that is sort of disgruntled with the system in their own way. Cryptocurrencies are inherently distrustful of anything that the, that any centralized government power does. Uh, you know, progressives are inherently distrustful of the market mechanism that uh, has taken power away from the government. The global south is inherently distrustful from imperialist powers from the global north, and the globalist 
in the global powers of the North are feeling like their own power is di diminishing and they have diverging uh, interests within their own countries that are sort of diverging their own and eroding their own power. I'm talking about the US and Europe primarily. And there's global players like China that are trying to establish their own identity in this global context. So how do you make all these considerations work? I don't know, but I just wanted to make sure that the clear problem that, uh, that I think also Andrew had like pointed to at the end is a collective action problem, understanding that we have to also bring in the questions of morality and, and, and vision for how to make this work, but also not be drawn away that this is sort of a, we can sort of do away with the problems that are already existing in the world and people are gonna hold on to the powers they have. And I think money plays in a very essential role because money empowers us potentially to do things, but we also have to understand that money, the, the, the deep understanding of money and manipulation of money um, has to be, has to probably be uh, complemented with other powers that are also not exclusively in the monetary sphere. And that's where, also maybe where my question centers, like that's maybe to Andrew because you've been working on this. So for now, what I've seen right now, especially your chart and quantitative easing is basically the central banks to the rescue. We're just putting a floor onto the world economy under numerous different crises and making sure that you know, there's liquidity in the market, there's, a, there's, a, there's anchored expectations and so forth. Okay. Uh, that has put the central banks much closer to the treasury than ever before. So now we have a question of central bank uh, independence. Is that still a thing? And a lot of people on the left are actually happy about this because this is a tool for good potentially, right? We can sort of re-democratize the central banks and make them do what we want them to do. Uh, so that's that's one, one option. And so we can ha just have to recapture them for the public interest instead of some other interest. But that puts, that's one big category of question right there, how that would work and then which, which countries does this work and which ones doesn't it work? Like there are constraints depending on what kind of country you are and where you are in the global hierarchy. But that centers the conversation of change around uh, the role, redefined role of government and especially the redefined role of how coordination specifically between the treasury and the central bank works. So that's one big hypothesis. And another one would be to sort of go in Michael's direction to say, okay, we don't, we, we think this whole thing is captured. Um, we want to go away from that and we're going to build something alternative on the side and try to go that route. Um, we all have trouble understanding that or seeing that because it's not there. We don't know, know what we're projecting uh, uh, that expectation of, but that's another sort of way. And I think a lot of the crypto um, ideas are sort of centered in that, in that sphere. So that's, that's fine. But my question, I think, in reality, we're, we're in this sort of first world, like the re, the, 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 this coordination problem with treasury and central banks, that is a real tension right now. And I think also the, the idea of what you raised, Andrew, central bank digital currencies, that's sort of an attempt of uh, fending off not just cryptocurrency per se, but also uh, being in the same game as Amazon and the platforms uh, and the, the other tokens that the big private uh, platforms are, are, are doing. Um, it's not completely clear that the that uh, what what that does, but I think uh, what, what I was trying to say here right now, the the objective is coordination. Uh, how do we achieve it is unclear. There is something happening through the crisis between um, in 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 the interface between central banks and the treasury. Everybody that's talking about reform is actually saying we have to re-engender the fiscal capacity of the treasuries. Okay, that's fine. I'm just wondering in this debate, Andrew, what your take is, like, where do you see this development going? Uh, and if you agree with my assessment, first of all, because I would tr I'm trying to sort of keep eye on the ball with something that's very, very volatile in terms of a very, very complex situation. So Andrew, what, what, do, you, what do you make of these, these developments and where do you see the, the, the actual current tension and, and potential for positive reform happening? Uh, Jay, you've made a very good um very insightful and comprehensive posing of the questions. You know, we are struggling with something bigger than all of us. Okay. This, this is, you know, we, we no longer have an Einstein. We no longer have a Michelangelo, right? We don't have people who can stand up and say, I know it all. Because the, 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 the amount of uh, com complex information and data is just going up like that, right? So the, 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 the idea that any one person 
you know, could have a wave a magic wand and say, I know the answer, uh, I think, you know, forget it. Why is that? Because to a large extent, you know, your, your understanding, your set of morality, your knowing is very different from mine. And, and therefore, we, we have, you know, through our rational uh, understanding, uh, or th through science, which is basically rational, okay, suddenly discovered that ration, ra rational thinking science alone will not convince at least one third of society that, th that they will not be convinced because that is due to something else, right? And remember this, it's not us versus them because us plus them is the whole. So to a large extent, we, you know, we really need to establish common understanding of what the problem is and how do we deal with this. Now, here's the question. When, when uh, Manko Olsen posed this question of collective action trap, it was very good. He suddenly, you know, uh, used the beautiful words to explain what we all struggle with. And then, of course, uh, uh, Eleanor uh, Olstrom, you know, the uh, who gained her, uh, she was a political scientist and an ecologist. She actually got the Nobel laureate because she said, if you really look at history, we have solved more collective action traps than not, which goes to show that human beings are actually much better than at solving the problems without necessarily having a clean, clear cut answer to this. Because every situation is very different. Every community is very different, right? How the community suddenly goes about negotiating with each other, you know, trading off issues, eventually finding the solution to deal with the common good. Maybe it's unique. We don't know what the common principles are yet. We do know that, you know, so far no theory has been able to guide us in this area. That's, that, that, that part I'm quite clear, okay. So my view, therefore, is that we really need to work on something together in order to try and build common trust so that we are seen to be able to, 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 to get where we want to go. Now, at the present moment, as you know, we have a global situation whereby disagreements become, you know, I need to demonize you and you need to demonize me. And we get more and more polarized. And if you're not careful, you can even come to blows, right? Or violence. And, and, and this is where we are now in a very precarious situation because the average growth looks good, but actually the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And, and that polarization is not sustainable. So how do we actually engender the action for this will depend upon, you know, hopefully people like the YSI, you know, like INET, really try to engender the new ideas for different people to experiment and actually implement, walk the talk as it were, and slowly get to the situation whereby more and more people realize that is the way to go. Okay, and uh, I, I like to use this uh, 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 story of Moses on the mountain, right? As you know, he led his people and they got lost in the desert. And then everybody started going back, worshiping all the whatever it was, and they were fighting amongst each other. And then he went up the mountain and then he, you know, uh, came down with the Ten Commandments. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, eight of them, did not tell you what to do. Eight of them, two of them, one said you must believe in God, 
which is fine. That is a, what you should do. But the other eight is what you should not do. And maybe we are in a situation in the world today, not doing something may be better than doing something. I, you know, I, I, I'm just turning the question around so that we need to appreciate, well, you know, we, we, we've been so proactive that we must do something about it. But the must do something actually creates its second and third order effects that we have not understood, right? So for example, we said we must have the vaccine and suddenly we've invented more vaccines in a faster time that, than anybody dreamt possible, except that you know, maybe 30% of the population do not believe in being vaccinated. And then on top of that, if they are not vaccinated and some people cannot be vaccinated, you have second and third order mutations that make the problem even worse, okay, right? So to some extent, we may, the human society may be reaching the situation where, whereby we are no longer homo deus. You know, we used to think that we can move, move from homo uh, sapiens to homo deus. We may need to have a little bit of humili humility to realize that unknown unknown is truly unknown unknown. We may not be able to find that answer. And therefore, ultimately, it is a moral question. And that moral question is a discovery process that some of us may have to go through in order finally to come to an understanding of where we have lost our way and where we need to move. That means we're, the paradigm is shifting, except that we don't know where that paradigm is moving because it's all over the place at the moment, at this point of time. So to, to put it as, 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 as simply as possible, we don't have a unique answer. There are multiple equilibria probably out there. And you know, we may need to search for different ones. From history has shown that actually diversity creates resilience, right? And therefore it's not necessary for everybody to have the same ideas, it doesn't really matter, you know, your ideas may cancel out mine. And so that the bad things that I do to you may be canceled out by the good deeds you do for me, right, or for the for, for somebody else. So to a large extent, what happens to the whole is much more important. Because if we don't protect, you know, Earth itself, we will destroy Earth and we will destroy humanity. That that part is clear. The only problem is was we seem to be getting less and less time for this. That's that's the that's the what we're, we're all struggling with. Okay, it's uh, it's 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 it, there are no easy answers, right? And I you know I I've come to the conclusion that there you know there are no simple answers to this, right? As Einstein said, you know the solution the 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 the, the theory need to be simple but not too simple. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it just needs to get into uh, a, a reasonable explanation. It becomes a narrative issue as, 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 as Robert Schiller has put it, right? What story can we now tell that the majority of people would believe and would enable us to work together to get out of this collective action trap? That's the real issue. Phenomenal. Thank you so much, Jay, for uh, your excellent summary and also um, for Mr. Shank for your response. Um, I think we've covered quite a, a wide range of really important questions, um, but I really appreciate what um, uh, Mr. Shang, you said about the fact that we all need to work together. Um, and I think that's what's exciting about YSI and INET, um, that we have uh, young scholars who are willing to experiment, um, older scholars who are willing to guide, and different opinions within this audience that are able to contribute towards this ongoing project that we're all part of. Um, um, and so we may not know where the paradigm will go, but at least we're walking towards it. And so I'm very grateful to be part of the series. Um, that is all from the audience and all from me. But again, thank you, Mr. Shang. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And maybe, Mike, if you have any last words, then I'll hand it over to you. But thank you so much. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think everything that needs to say has been said in this. Uh, I just can't thank you enough, Mr. Shang, for being a part of this. It's uh, 
it's truly an honor to be able to speak with you. And uh, I hope to speak with you again uh, in the near future. And thank you to everybody who's been coming to this, uh, this entire series. This, of course, wraps it up. And I hope you are enlightened and inspired to go out and uh, challenge some of these questions. And even though, <laughs> uh, speaking to the eight, the eight of the Ten Commandments, we may not know exactly what we need to do, but at least we've got a good idea of what not to do in the future. So thank you, everybody. And good, good morning, good evening, and good night. <laughs> good night. Thank you all for inviting me. Great honor. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jay. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thanks, Take Christina. Care. Thank Take you care. all. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay, Bye. Stay, stay safe. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Same to you. Bye. All right. I think we can end the recording at this point. All righty. Do you want to stop recording?